Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. This is the special government shutdown edition today. Um, today, we're very lucky to be joined by Marvin Weinstein, who's uh, come across to us from Slack, uh, where he's a theoretical physicist working uh, there at the National Acceler Accelerator Lab. Uh, Marvin's uh, two of his career interests have been uh, data mining in uh, quantum field uh, theory and quantum dynamics. Uh, he's uh, also worked in uh, chiral symmetry, uh, PCAC and uh, current algebra, <laughs> Hamiltonian lattice field theory, non-perturbative methods um, in field theory and lattice gauge theory. Uh, and uh, he, relevant for today's talk, he's uh, the co-inventor of uh, dynamical quantum clustering, DQC method, uh, which is used for uh, finding uh, hidden data in complex data sets. He also has online a uh, Maple page for uh, for those who might be interested in, in the audience uh, for displaying FITS files and optical ray tracing, uh, manipulating quantum operators and uh, conducting large Thank lattice you, computations. Uh, and also to help you present talks uh, as well using Maple. Um, so today he's going to talk to us about uh, finding uh, hidden data in complex data sets. So please join me in welcoming Mom. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I must say this is only my second time at the SETI Institute. First time I was attending a series of talks here. And uh, I, this time I actually got the tour, and it's very impressive. So I thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I hope, so one thing about me, which is, besides all of that irrelevant information, I like to be interrupted. The only thing that will happen is the talk will either get longer or we will run at the end. I plan to talk on about five different topics, and that can be changed according to interest. But it helps if people who are confused actually ask questions, OK? So what do I want to talk to you about today? Well, it's, it's a very, how many of you are? Small group. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a, a very different kind of algorithm for dealing with large complex data. And by complex data, I mean high dimensional data, which has structure in it that most data mining algorithms don't start by assuming isn't there. So they're never going to find it. Okay? And we now know for a fact that large data sets sometimes, not always, contain interesting structures that are meaningful and carry information. In the first example, I'll show you that. Okay? But uh, the question is really, how do you search for a needle in a high dimensional haystack? Okay? When you don't know what a needle is and you're not sure it's in the haystack. Okay? So developing an algorithm like that for something you don't know exists uh, is hard, apparently. And it obviously starts out by assuming you're not going to make any assumptions about the data. You're not going to try to model it. You're not going to try to uh, make a statistical hypothesis about what's there. You're going to let the data speak for itself. <clears throat> so DQC, the algorithm, is a tool for visually discovering subsets of complex data. And what it's doing is, since it's able to work in rather high dimension, okay, we don't have to cut things down to two or three dimensions to look at them. We typically look at things in six and higher. I frequently work in 10 to 20. And you can work in hundreds if you're willing to pay the price in compute time. The price is linear with DQC. That's very unusual. As the dimension goes up, the time it takes to do an analysis grows linearly with the dimension of the data. That is the number of features that you're using to look at simultaneously. And it grows linear with the size of the data set, the number of entries in the data set. So, and it's highly parallel. So anal a DQC analysis is really a paradigm shift. What I want to show you is DQC used as a tool for exploring data interactively and visually. It moves you away from a, a hypothesis-driven search, which is most statistical searches, or most searches where you do Monte Carlo modeling of data, or something like that, towards a methodology where you simply let the data tell you if there's anything in it. Okay? I will try to convince you we can do just that. The, Principal advantages are no subject matter information is used in a DQC analysis. We couldn't care less where the data comes from. <laughs> we, we eat all kinds of numerical data. Okay? 
Uh, it's unbiased in, in really everybody says they're unbiased, so I should tell you what unbiased really means for us. Unbiased in this case means we're unlike k-means or c-means or support vector machine algorithms or even machine learning algorithms where we start out assuming there's something in the data and we assume how many things are there and then we try to find those things, okay? Most algorithms, divisive algorithms, agglomerative algorithms, c-means, k-means algorithms, they all put a number in which is how many clusters am I going to find? We don't put any such number in. We're perfectly happy to find nothing. If we find nothing, we tell you you've got lousy data. There's nothing in it, okay? No, that, that's important. There'll be a thing I won't talk about, which was data on Alzheimer's disease, where somebody gave me this data set on 350,000 SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, <coughs> and on 1,500 patients, and they said, what's in this data? And I came back and I said, I'm sorry, we can't find anything in your data. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to people at the proteomics group and the uh, Department of Translational Medicine at Stanford, where they do a lot of data mining. And I said, we couldn't find anything, so that's our failure mode. And he said, no, we now know after 10 years of work, there's nothing in that data. Okay, so not finding something was, in that case, a success. Okay, it's hard to show you not finding anything, but uh, okay. All right, so let me give you a little bit of an idea. I'm not going to attempt to teach you quantum mechanics, and I'm not going to attempt to explain the algorithm in great detail, but I'd like to give you pictures of roughly what the algorithm does. So in some sense, it's a density-based algorithm. After all, if I have a multidimensional feature space, that is, I'm measuring many variables about something, finding correlations in that feature space means there are subsets of the data that are more dense in the feature space. More guys are located in the same place. So this works by trying to work off the density of the data in high dimensional feature space. which is not supposed to be possible, but it really is. Okay, and the idea behind it is something that was invented many years ago by Emmanuel Parsons. And he said, well, he started it. And he said, look, let me imagine that I have data points in my space. Okay, I'm supposed to use my finger here. Okay, <clears throat> and I'm going to write a Gaussian function located at each of those data points, add up all of those functions, and then hope that where there's more stuff, I'll see distinct peaks. And where there's less stuff, I'll see distinct minima. Now, this was the idea put forward. You would, in multidimensional space, find all the peaks. You would characterize the maxima. You would find the region to go back, and then say all the points that lay in a certain maximum were a cluster. Not a bad idea, but this shows you what happens. A 3% change in the parameter gamma, the width of the Gaussian, already changes uh, the character of the function dramatically, and features disappear rapidly. So what we need is something which will remove that sensitivity to that parameter, <coughs> and also improve the contrast in the data so that you can identify things in a, more, in, in a more robust way. The idea that comes from physics, where, where a quantum mechanics intuition comes in, is if you look at the Parson function in any number of dimensions, you know, it says it's a positive function, it's just the sum of Gaussians. It's a candidate for the ground state of some Schrodinger equation, some equation of this form. What physicists know is that maxima in that function will correspond to minima in the potential function v and they'll be very washed out by the kinetic term, the uncertainty principle term. You lose features. So if we can find v, we expect to find something that is a much more accurate tracer of density, a proxy for density, and even I can solve that equation if I set it equal to zero on the right-hand side, and I'm always free to do that by adding a constant to v. So it's simply the function I constructed by adding up the uh, Gaussians. I take the second derivative of that function, and I divide it by the function itself. And what I have is a potential function which <coughs> gives me an enha contrast-enhanced sample. So what are you supposed to see in these three things? You're seeing the parameter change, and you're seeing when 
the potential function, which is in red, starts to show features where the parson function doesn't. So we're moving the points together to make them overlap. And you see the distinct qualities, even when it's five guys, if you look at the green curve, there's essentially no features when the potential has already seen five minima. Okay? Do this better. This is what the Parson function looks like. The blue curve is the Parson function for five points. And I vary the parameter gamma, so I'm already sitting at the far edge in gamma of what I can see. And what I want you to see is you can't see anything in the Parson function. Everything is actually points of inflection. But the potential still has the features you want it to have. So over a wide range of parameters, the potential function is in fact doing the job. It's contrast enhancing. It's a contrast enhanced, think of it like Photoshop. It's a contrast enhanced image or proxy function for the density. Yes? But you're taking derivatives, which kind of explains why you see the peaks. Absolutely. That also enhances the noise. Don't you pay a, a noise signal noise uh, penalty? Not so that we see it, ever. No, we're not enhancing the noise, actually, in this case. Because you're you working with the Gaussian functions. Okay, now you'll see, that, uh, you'll see how we look at data and how noisy it gets. But the basic idea, so you'll like this because this is 350, in fact, he gave me the data. This is 330,000 galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You'll forgive me if my numbers are a little loose. It's a long time since I did this. And whether it's 330 or 350, I don't remember, but it's, I think, 330. And this is just to show you for a thin slice of z. We know this thing has structure, OK? It's clear. But not only, and what you're seeing down here, can't point to my own screen. What you're seeing down there is a thin slice in z for a modest value of sigma or gamma. And basically, you're looking at uh, what the potential function looks like, and the yellow points down here that you see is the data. I've turned the potential upside down so you can see. You can't see it in this thing up here, but here you see it really hugs the data. The parallax you see is I had to move the points off the potential a little bit so you could see them. Otherwise, they would be buried in the surface and you wouldn't see them. So, oh, the theta and phi on the sky, and z is... Uh, fixed to be so yeah okay it, it's the redshift z is the redshift right we're looking at galaxies on the sky from the sloan digital sky survey so it's theta phi our theta phi on the sky and redshift okay which is of course a proxy for distance okay this is now the whole idea here if you think about it is if i look at the potential how do i collect the points very simple let them roll downhill in the potential after all. Now, we use tricks in quantum mechanics to make that something you can do efficiently, okay? Because if you imagine you're dealing with millions of points in 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions, rolling them downhill by gradient descent starts to take a long, long, long time. But in point of fact, because this is a quantum mechanics problem, we can cheat. <laughs> and that's a whole story <laughs> that we change the problem of doing analytics on this stuff in fact, doing matrix multiplication. And that runs fast, and it's highly parallelizable. So uh, we can send it out to millions of machines if we need to run them downhill at the same time. This is the three-dimensional data running downhill. And now, this is two different views of the same data in the sky. And what you're seeing is guys collecting at the higher density regions. And you see the the filaments and the voids appearing. The higher density regions are what this is collecting onto. And the topology of these things is complex. Now, if the people here who know data mining are going to know that seeing structures in the data that represent equal density or m close to equal density and intersect and do things like that, that's not easy. In fact, it's not usually done. Okay, there are very few algorithms that pretend to be able to do it. And something like support vector machine can see not very complex structures, really can, but at the expense of declaring 98% of the data to be outliers or something like that in the algorithm. So here, 
we don't deal with training sets, we don't do anything to the data, and we don't assume anything about the structure. We, they take the data, we plot it, so this is without singular value decomposition. We just do it on the sky. We take the data, we plot it, we make the function, we roll the points downhill. That's the whole algorithm. It's simple. It's not, okay, it's just weird, but it's simple. All right, so singular value decomposition. How many people here know what it is? One, two. I guess I should tell you what it is. So the singular value decomposition is basically the Swiss Army knife of data mining. Okay, uh, it really is a way of looking at data matrices. So if you look at a matrix, okay, it says I can always make that matrix as a product of three matrices. The first U and V transpose are in fact uh, unitary matrices and S is diagonal. Well, that is it only has entries on the principal diagonal. It doesn't, it can be an N by M matrix and so it, it, it's not a rectangular, it, it's a rectangular matrix, not an exact one. What this says is you can approximate the data by the eigenvalues that appear in S times a column in U and a particular row in V. So if you leave, lam the lambdas are decreasing and they decrease sometimes very rapidly and that's where stochastic noise shows up, not uh, noise that's not stochastic, but the small eigenvalues typically contain noise. The larger eigenvalues contain the data. How good is it at doing that? Well, think of a picture as being a data matrix. After all, it's a megapixel worth of uh, numbers which run from 0 to 16. And uh, if you take the first five terms in the SVD decomposition, you get that. 10 terms get that. 20 terms already is very good. Remember, this is a megapixel. You've reduced it to 100 terms. It's 10% it's of the size of the data you have to store for that is 10%. What you're seeing, of course, is that by 20 terms, you're doing a very good job. So you say, when you do an SVD decomposition and dimensional reduction by leaving terms out, what you're really doing is saying, I'm going to construct a pretty good approximation to my data matrix and work with that. Okay, so if you do SVD, this is a, a particular piece of noisy data that's approximated by the first six terms in an SVD decomposition, and it's typical. The, the stochastic noise is all over the place. Systematic noise appears as peaks. You capture most of the structure of the data by working in six dimensions in this case. Now, in other cases, it's 10 or 20, but here it's six. The first thing I want to talk to you about, so the data sets I'll talk about now, I'm going to talk about five. They come from X-ray nanochemistry. They come from pump probe experiments at the linear coherent lights, the slack coherent light source. Okay, uh, LINAC coherent light source. Um, they come from uh, earthquake data, biology data, and finance data. All of these data sets are different. All of these data sets have a unique characteristic. The first two are rather large. They're very noisy. Uh, they have uh, no separation between the data points, really. That is, usually, if you're doing a divisive algorithm or k-means or support vector, you need there to be some gaps between the data as you're trying to locate the best surfaces on which to separate the data. And when you see this data, you'll see there's absolutely no divisions in the data. What there are are big density changes. And that's what we're exploiting. Okay, so these are things in which the conventional algorithms just don't work. And they've been tested. They don't work on this example, for example. So the data set is 148 dimensional data. It's 669,000 X-ray absorption curves. The idea is to take each of these curves and identify which ones look like one another, okay? Which ones are similar? Uh, I'm gonna show you how well that works in this kind of a thing using DQC. I'll show you the difficulty of the data. You shouldn't, the conventional way of analyzing data of this type is to have reference spectra that uh, are the materials that think are present in the sample. And then you do a statistical fit using linear combinations of the reference spectra. 
But the problem with that, of course, is reference spectra <laughs> aren't all that different. And you can use many different reference spectra and get the same quality of results. And so what you really want to do is not make any assumptions about what's in the data, because that's the only way you're going to find the needle in the haystack. And in this data, there is a needle in the haystack, and I'll show it to you. And you can not only find it, but you can then identify it and find out what it is. OK? Uh, OK, the, the data comes from an x-ray absorption study of uh, a piece of pottery that comes from a Roman urn that dates to around 6th century BC. Uh, why this? It, w this is really because it's a proxy for studying the physics of a lithium ion batteries, anode and cathode. But this was a, a problem which you knew what was going on, OK? And so <clears throat> the question is, how many of you think you know the answer? So what are the pigments that are used on that urn? It's lasted a long time. It's the glossy black and red pigments. You're comfortable that the Greeks and Romans invented this technology roughly at the same time. And how many of you think they are pigments? What a chicken group. OK, they're, <laughs> they're not. So you, will, you were right to be suspicious. They're actually a tour de force in chemistry. Both the Greeks and the Romans discovered that if you took red clay, hematite, rust, that's what it is, OK? That's what makes the red desert red in Australia. I don't know if you've ever seen the red desert. It's red. <laughs> From the sky, it's unbelievably red. Anyway, you take that, and you make an urn out of it, and then you fire it in an oven, and it's in an oxygen-poor environment, so you get a lot of carbon monoxide, which is a reducing atmosphere, and it changes the hematite, which is red, to hersonite, which is black. And they discovered when they took it out of the oven and let it stay warm for a long time, it turned red again. You're not surprised. It reoxidized. Okay. So somebody clever came up with the idea, what if I take the clay and find the finest particles of clay and make a slip? And, and after all, the only way it's turning red again deep in the sample is because oxygen is percolating through the cracks and pores of the thing. Let me clog up the pores where I want it to stay black. So they did that. They heated the urn. Everything turned black. And then only the porous areas turned back to red. This is a lost technology that people are doing these kinds of experiments, so-called forensic anthropologists, to try to resurrect it. So what's the game here? The game here is we have a very small sample. The TXM Zanes microscope at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Lab is a new tool that allows you to take a megapixel of data, okay, uh, where the little squares are 30 nanometers on a side. And the whole thing is 1,000 times that, or 3 microns. Okay, And you're looking at a fairly large sample. So that's what you have to do if what you want to see is both detailed chemical information and structural information, morphology information, uh, at the same time. You need both a large field of view and high resolution. And so the idea is you send an x-ray beam through this at specific energy and you see the transmitted beam or the absorption and the absorption curve here says oh I get big absorption at a certain energy and that energy is of course where you're able to knock an electron out of the inner shell of the iron okay and the details of the curve up here are telling you something about the local chemistry in the surrounding region the exact location of this rise is directly related to the oxidation state of the iron. So slight shifts in that are what you're trying to do to identify things. And details of the shape of the curve is what you're after. To show you this really happens, that's a movie of the whole megapixel at different energies. And you see, you very definitely see different features of the sample. Okay? As the energy changes, it does different things. These are what spectra look like, lest you think I'm getting very nice curves. They've already been separated into things that look similar. But as you can see, they're noisy. They're not all that similar. Stuff is going on. That's the data we have to work with. There's roughly order of a million of these, 700,000. And we have to say which ones look more like one another without building in any assumptions about how we're going to do that. In this case, we did a singular value decomposition of the data, and we worked in six dimensions. 
Uh, as I say at the bottom, k means doesn't see any structure here. This is what the data looks like in dimensions 1, 2, and 3. That is the singular value decomposition dimensions 1, 2, 3. This little blue area here, notice the colors here were assigned at the end of the analysis. I'm plotting them back on the original data so you know they're making some sense. But I'll tell you about this in a second. But this is the needle in a haystack. It's 2,000 points out of 669,000. And hidden in there are 69 points of great interest. So we're pulling things out at a level of a part and ten to the four, not that you could call outliers. They're really just exceptional data. And uh, this is what happens as I start rolling things downhill. So I build a potential for this in six dimensions, and we start the process, and we get a movie. Now, one thing I want to say, unlike algorithms that at the end result is all that matters, because the intermediate stages don't, every frame of this you'll see means something. Okay? So what happens? The data starts to pull apart. The blue guy falls to the bottom. He gets smaller. There he is down here. And by a few frames in, it's a point. Okay? That's the isolated cluster of some interest. And the other guys reach this shape and stop changing. <laughs> That's what happens to them. What does that mean? That means that there are parameterizable structures in the data. Not all of the data. Pieces of the data are highly correlated with one another. But they vary in some one or two dimensional way that can be parameterized. At least that's the guess. So guys that are in connected structures are thought to be the same thing, more or less, except for some difference between them which we can understand. So that's the first thing I wanted to tell you, these structures show up. They frequently show up. Not always, but they frequently show up in data. They persist and they're meaningful now. And how do we find out if they're meaningful? I did this stupid exercise, but how do I extract anything from it? I go back to the original data. I take the dancing man here, you may like that name or not, and I break it up into its pieces and I average the tens of thousands of points in each piece separately and plot the data. Now that gets rid of the stochastic noise in the individual curves, but it produces rather nice looking curves that look very similar, except they differ here in the area before the sharp rise. What does that mean? That means there's stuff other than iron that's absorbing x-rays because the iron doesn't start absorbing x-rays. That's what the uh, chemists call the matrix in the sample, the matrix of the iron. They also have a different jump from this point to that point. That reflects the density of the iron in that pixel, in that set of pixels. And so what do people normally do when they analyze the data? They say, we don't want to see either one of those things. We can get that information other ways. Uh, and they take the data and they do what's called normalizing it. So stuff goes into that to begin with. That is, they take the first, so I'll give you a simple normalization algorithm. I say that this funny structure is representing different amounts of matrix for each pixel and different amounts of jump, different density. And those two parameters are the two dimensions. So if I'm right, all I have to do is do what they would do before they start their analysis. I take the 20, first 20 points of every single curve, average it, and subtract it from the curve. That makes all curves start roughly at zero. Okay? Then I take the last 20 points in each of the subtracted curves, and I average it, and I normalize them to one. I rescale the curves. Now there shouldn't be matrix and density information. This red curve here is the same average for the normalized data for the four different curves. I think there's no question by removing density and matrix these things have become exactly the same. Okay. No statistics involved. The green curve is a similar four or five curves for the shape I didn't show you, which in higher dimensions looks like a starfish. It's five pieces, and we call it the starfish. Okay. So back to the sample. I've assigned colors to the different pieces, and I showed you the little blue guy. And so basically, all we have to do is put it back on the picture and say, where are these things located? We didn't use any geographical information about the sample. 
in doing this analysis. So this is a sanity check. The things are in places you expect it to be. And in a minute, I'll compare it to the other supervised way of doing the same analysis. But what I want you to look at is the little blue guy, which is 2,000 points, and the little black spot there, which is 69 points. The black spot is easily seen once you have it and compare it to the spectrum for pure iron, unoxidized iron. That's iron. The blue guys are mixtures of magnetite, hematite, and hersonite in different amounts. And we're able to see that too. The green guys are hematite. You'll fault me on my choice of colors, but I did it because that's what these guys did to compare to them. And the red guys are hersonite. This is a look at the sample going in from the surface. What you see on the right is the result of a, su oops, a supervised fit. Um, <clears throat> that was done by taking each curve, normalizing the data, taking each resulting curve, and assuming there was hematite, hersonite, and iron present, and doing a statistical fit. You can see that we see a lot more detail. We agree with them in structure, okay, uh, and we've made no assumptions about what we're doing. Okay, I have to move on since no questions. So now I want to talk to you about data that comes from an experiment in statistical mechanics, basically. This is a so-called pump probe experiment. It's measuring non-equilibrium phonon dynamics in a piece of germanium. The idea is you take a single germanium crystal, you first, well, you hit it with both an X-ray beam from the la X-ray laser, and you hit it with an infrared beam. The infrared beam causes the crystal to go into oscillation, exciting phonons, okay? And so basically <clears throat> what you're trying to do is first hit it with the X-ray beam before the infrared beam is turned on, hit it with the pulse from the infrared beam, and watch it ring. That thing, if you can look at the correlations between different places on the sample, will tell you what's going on with the phonons in the sample and see if you can measure the scattering off the phonons. I don't want to go into the physics too much, but this is a case where we're going to find only 2% of the data is clean. 97.3% of the data is a mixture of noisy pixels and stuff we're not interested in. But we don't know this from the beginning, OK? So <clears throat> this is what all the data looks like. Now, this is done in nine dimensions. And this shows you the evolution from beginning to end. And the important thing is another one of these extended structures has appeared and a few more big extended structures. They're 95% of the data. Okay, we take them, we look, play the same game, go back, average the curves, look at the different pieces. They look rather similar except for the height at this end. Scale each curve so it's one at the end and they look identical essentially. So now the question is what the hell are we looking at with 95% of the data? looks like this. Well, let's make a picture of the data. It's, after all, a sample. So I told you this. This is the way the data would look to the guys who are uh, normally plotting it. They might plot it in color, but you see there are two bright areas, and the rest is not very bright. Okay? What does it look like if I plot it my way so it sees more? Okay? Uh, this is <clears throat> the same data. The divisions you see here are the CCDs on the detector, okay? So they're being imaged by their internal noise, okay? The uh, peaks are diffuse scattering from the Bragg peaks in the sample. That is, what happens is there are Bragg, you know that when you hit a coherent X-ray beam on a crystal, there are directions at which you get coherent scattering, and then uh, if we sit on the Bragg peaks, or if the experimentalists sit on the Bragg peaks, they burn out their detector. So they go slightly <laughs> off the Bragg peak and they look at what's called diffuse scattering. When the phonons are there, what happens is you're in the region where it's not N squared, but it's not N either that you see for the scattering. And, and when the phonons are exciting the whole thing, you, you get incoherent scattering from them, diffuse scattering, and it steals from the Bragg peak. So you see them almost in the same location as the Bragg peaks. And where the points are located on the sample has something to do with which phonon you're looking at. This is what DQC evolution of just the data in the peaks looks like. And so this is in dimensions 1, 2, and 3. And 
I can let this run all the way, but you'll see there most of the data just ends up in single points. Interesting thing about this data, as you might expect, so we're comparing the spectra that we're getting for every single point as a function of time. And since there are a lot of phonons, <laughs> there are a lot of clusters. In this case, you get 669 clusters. They pass through, again, some shapes which are extended and similar, and we can figure out what they are, in fact, by not going all the way to the end and pulling them out. But basically, each of those eventually goes away. But they are metastable for a very long time, and that's interesting. Okay? Again, this is dimension 7, 8, and 9. I'm boring you with this for only one reason. We've had referees tell us, I know very well you can't cluster in nine dimensions. This can't work. <laughs> this is what happens. Oh, oh. Um, no, actually, it's a bit of a story to tell you what the difference so one of the tricks that you can get out of this, remember I'm, I'm evolving several hundred thousand points uh, in nine dimensions. But this is a problem in quantum mechanics. So when I look at all the data and it's very dense, the points aren't all linearly independent of one another thought as functions in Hilbert space. It's possible to choose a basis of about 4,000 points, okay, uh, which spans all of the vectors in the Hilbert space. The way you do your numerical stuff is to work with that, quote, template. That is not chosen accidentally because you're finding a basis. You pick a vector, then you find the one that's furthest from it and so forth until you get something that reproduces all the vectors to high ac or to whatever accuracy you need. And the red points are the template, and the uh, blue points are the points that are not in the template. So it eventually goes down. M many of the red points here are hundreds of points in the template. But It's uh, 669 clusters. 669 No, it's really easy to run through the data now and find every cluster algorithmically. And in each cluster, I have a set of curves, and you ask me the perfect question. This is, there are two kinds of clusters when you look at the data. It's only 669, so you can play this game on all of them if you want. Okay. You see, this is typically what's in a single cluster. This is a 12-point cluster or something like that. This is the average of those points. So you see that the noise in the beginning goes away, but the features stay. This is what you're looking for. Before time t equals 40, or that's negative times, really, before the laser is turned on, you don't see anything. And after the laser is turned on, you see a signal. That's what you're looking for, OK? Uh, this is data that belongs to what we call a noisy cluster. There's definitely structure up here, but it's a lot harder to work with this data because the t less than 40 data shows as much signal as the t greater than 40 data. Okay? These are averages for different kinds, and you're clearly seeing different frequency excitations. Yes? For some of those clusters that are like a long string or a couple of strings, mm -hmm. Well, the name of the game, yeah, we, I, I didn't do that carefully for this. I, I did it for some things. Uh, yes, the answer is yes to your question. You find them, right? And you can chop them up. And there's still thousands of hundreds or thousands of points. So you can, in fact, average those. I, I told you it's an exploratory thing. You just go in and chop them up, and you can find out what's different about them. You saw me do it in the first one. Absolutely. And, and so that's how you're solving the dilemma of uh, higher dimensional uh, reduction to a lower dimensional space. No, no. I, I wouldn't agree with that. Well, I'll tell you what I think, OK? Uh, no, what we're doing is we're finding proxy for density and collecting things in the region of high density. Dimensional reduction is 
not important in that, except you, from your question, you know very well if I take data and I do a hard dimensional reduction, I'll give you many examples. If there are features like what you're seeing, they're going to show up as bumps. They're not going to show up as structures, okay? So this was done in nine dimensions. It was also done in 20 dimensions. The 20 dimensional clustering was no different from the nine dimensional clustering, so that the next 200 frames in the animation were generated in nine, okay? The movie that we make varies, but since we don't care very much about the dimension, going from nine to 20 is a factor of two in running time. All of this only runs on my desktop machine. Uh, uh, well, it's a very capable desktop machine. It <laughs> has 48 cores in it and 32 gigabytes of RAM. So calling it a desktop is maybe an exaggeration. But it's on one single box under my desk. <laughs> OK. Um, this is the separation you get. And by looking at the averages, you can make an algorithmic cut. I can just say, take the average of the first 40 points in the average. So this is two averages. First, I form the average 669 clusters. Then I take the average of the s amplitude of the signal in the first 40 points. And then I take it in the next 140, 100 points or something. And I say, if they differ by a factor of two, I put it into the clean data sample. If they're worse than that, I put it into the noisy data sample. And you can see it does a pretty good job separating what you would eyeball say is noisy and clean. This is a picture on the sample of the peaks. This is the clean data, very good clean data and not much noise in the center of the peak where the amplitude is very large. Okay, Starts to be noisy out in the tails. They're interleaved with one another. Here's a region, noisy and clean. And uh, that means if I just did the usual thing of cleaning it up, I would probably be throwing away a lot of good data. I'm not, because this is what turned up not to be noisy. It had friends next to it that were noisy. They could be dead pixels. They could be noisy pixels. They could be bad things in the detector. Why do I say that? Look at this hole here. There's a nice round hole, <laughs> a nice round black spot. There's a damage on the detector. So that even the noisy data is useful data. It tells me something about the detector rather than telling me what I want to know about the experiment. These are a couple of clusters in the same plot to show the ones that are correlated. And you see you get correlations between different momenta. And that's exactly what you were looking for for a coherent excitation of the sample. So you can do a detailed point-by-point -point correlation study now, having separated out the good data. OK, so this example shows you can drill down from a surprising beginning Find out what's in the data set. <laughs> Extract the 0.87% of the data you want to work with. The big thing in this example was you ended up with a very large number of clusters. Normal algorithms would never assume there are 669 clusters. I have a nodding man in the back. Talk to him. He'll vouch for it. <laughs> OK. The number of clusters is what the data says that are there, not what we guess at the outset. OK. Uh, OK. See, this is data for earthquakes in the Middle East over a long period. I really have to go faster. So it's a small data set. What's interesting about this data set is nobody thought there was anything interesting in this data set. Okay, and so the way earthquakes are usually classified <coughs> is in terms of location, time, and magnitude. But they do measure other things about the seismic traces. They measure what's called the moment of the earthquake, the stress, the radius of the earthquake, and this funny thing, F0, the corner frequency, which is they look at the Fourier decomposition of the trace, and it's the frequency at which the amplitude of the Fourier decomposition starts to drop like 1 over frequency squared. I have no idea what I should do, but we had this data. It was collected from tens of seismic stations all over the Middle East, Israel, Iran, Iraq. Jordan, they don't have the same way of doing things. They don't have the same way of reducing the data. It's problematic data to work with to begin with. This is what the evolution looks like for the 5,000 quakes in this data, 6,500 quakes in this data. Uh, and it, this doesn't go all the way to the end. It just shows you, in fact, that things are separating into significantly different structures. 
Put it on a map of the Middle East. Amusing. The gold guys are all in one location off the Gulf of Aqaba. <coughs> the red guys go out into the Sinai. They're characteristically different. Okay, these are the locations of the various pieces. The geophysicists didn't say a word about this kind of structure being in the data. I mean, they knew there was a significant earthquake in the Gulf of Aqaba. Okay, but they didn't know it was characteristically, dis it was characteristically different based upon physical parameters associated with the measurement. Okay, they knew there was a big quake there at that time. <laughs> okay. This is what the data looks like, plotting it in the space of features. And I'm doing this only to show you, well, when I color it, you see the structure. If I don't color it, I think you'd be hard-pressed to know where to separate things. This is the date that quakes, again, plotted when they occurred. Okay? Note, neither piece of information, neither geographical information nor time information, was used in the analysis. Only physical parameters. These quakes occurred primarily, these kinds of quakes occurred at a specific point in time, okay, at a specific location. So again, this is data which is small, but when you look at the density distribution of the data, there's information you didn't know was there. I'm going to rush you to show you a very different kind of use of DQC. Up until now, we've been exploring data to see what kind of information was in the data digging down, finding structures, figuring out what they are, going back to the data and verifying that it made sense. This was all done before you do statistical modeling. I didn't talk about that. You're perfectly free to go back and try to assign a p-value and anything else to all of this. I invite you to. But to see what was in the data, you didn't have to do that. And that was important, okay? And I think, at least it convinced me that once we did the analyses we did and we knew the science, we knew what we were looking at, okay? Uh, but there are other ways of looking at problems. There are problems that DQC can deal with that's hard with other methods. And the reason is there are many problems where you measure things. You, you have a classification of things. How many people will default on their mortgage? You know who defaults. You know who doesn't. How many people will default on their bank loans? How many people will buy a red car versus a green car? Then you measure everything you can about the people. But it's not usually the number you wanted, right? Most people you don't know in advance, will they buy a red car or a green car? You want to know if it, things you measure carry the information to make the prediction you're interested in. Okay? Now, in biology, there's a cute thing that has to do with protein structure, OK? It's important if you're using a method that does data mining on this stuff, then it's important the method have no built-in assumptions. If I build in assumptions, then I can't tell you if the data has the information or not, because I could be looking at what I put in. Okay? So in this case, you know that your cells exchange water with the environment. It occurs way too fast to be diffusion. That is, water moves in and out of a cell at a rate that's very high. So there have to be channels. There's a Nobel Prize for saying there are channels through which the water moves. These channels are created by proteins. The proteins are called aquaporins. There are several kinds of aquaporins. Some move water, some move glycerol. Glycerol is of no interest biologically, really, but all the things that attach themselves to glycerol are of interest. So question, it's easy to get, but figuring out the structure of the protein. Because, so why do I want to do that? There are diseases associated with malformation of these things. They're serious diseases. And if you could figure out how to manipulate these proteins, identify targets to modify the proteins at, then you could alleviate some serious diseases. And so the question is, can I tell the difference between an aquaporin that's water and an aquaporin that's glycerol? If I only know the, so a protein is a long chain of amino acids. There are 20 amino acids. Okay, you can get that sequence from the genome. What you can't get is the 3D structure of the protein, which is what you really need to go in and look and see where is the channel and who's near the channel and who's controlling what's going on in the channel. So the question is, if I only have the linear sequence information, is that enough 
to tell me which is water, which is glycerol. And if it's enough, can I figure out which locations along the chain determine that difference? Okay. So we can do that because we take the data, there's not a lot of it, and we plot it. And I colored the glycerol and the water, and it doesn't show up well as red and green. If you look at that data and you squint, yeah, there's greens over here, there are reds over there. But on the whole, you think the information is present. But if I cluster it using DQC for density in the higher dimensions, in dimensions two and three, I get this structure. It's pretty clear there's information, but it's probably pretty noisy. Okay? I'm looking at things that are irrelevant to the classification. However, this is happening in dimensions two and three. So I go of the SVD decomposition, so this is 200 amino acids long. Uh, I look in dimensions two and three at the vectors for dimensions two and three, and I ask which locations have big amplitudes in them. And that turns out to be 12. Okay. Well, there's two different ways of making that cut, but it's either 12 or 20. So I can now go back and say, are those the important locations? So I can reduce the data to keeping only those 12 features. Do the same thing, well, maybe it's a little better. But when I cluster it, it's clean. Okay. So yes, I threw away noise. This is almost all. One type, this is almost all. The other type, they've simply separated. And so these are the ones that are candidates to search to see which ones take unique values on a glycerol versus on a water. So you make some histograms. Well, you can see. Ten and a half, by the way, is, uh, that's called a gap. <laughs> These sequences are aligned. They're not all the same length, and there are gaps. Ten and a half was set to be the value. So when you see ten and a half, that doesn't mean anything. But it's pretty damn clear the red here is never the same as the green there. There are about four locations like this. The gold standard for doing this analysis is a so-called correlated sequence analysis. It has three or four parameters that have to be diddled. The guys in Singapore who were doing the correlated sequence analysis didn't find two of these four locations. When I showed it to them, and there's no question, they're distinct. Uh, oh, and it could very well be, so I gave a <laughs> talk to the proteomics group at Stanford. <clears throat> and they said, but which amino acids are at those locations? And I say, damn if I know. He said, it matters because that could be unique. Okay, not all the amino acids differ in their specific binding. So there are some that should be treated as if they were the same. Okay, and so he said, probably those two peaks there, here and here, are really two proteins, two amino acids, that bind the same way to things. And so they're really unique locations. So at any rate, here's an example of saying, I'm looking at data. I don't know if the information is in my data to solve my problem, but I'm doing an analysis that doesn't assume it is. As I told you with uh, the Alzheimer's data, we found nothing. By the way, we've run this, just to forestall the next question, we've run it on big random data. You watch the movie. <laughs> nothing happens. Rude end little things start to form, but nobody really collapses. The stuff you've seen is dramatic. Okay? If I only see this, I tell you there's nothing in your data. If I see a dancing man, I say, shit, there's a lot, oh, excuse me, there's a lot of stuff in that data, <laughs> okay. Okay, um, so the important thing here is we're not building in assumptions about what's there, so we can trust the answer, and we can check it. The last thing is just for fun, it's financial data, that's because Dan is in the audience, and I guessed he was gonna be here. So um, this is the S&P prices for 400 stocks that existed from January 1st, 2000 to February 24th, 2000. No, that's wrong. I typed something. It's 10 years of data. Uh, it's, it's 3, 000, it should be 2011. That's what that should say. <clears throat> so you can look at the data in several ways. You could just say, Look at the changes starting on day one of a given stock and cluster the stocks on that set of changes. So you're looking for stocks which have similar time dependence and changes, okay? 
what do you find? What you find is the stocks end up in about 11 or 10 or 11, there are nine, which are the sectors of the market as people define them, okay? So that's not surprising. You would have expected that the fluctuations in the sectors of the market track one another. I don't want to talk about that. What I want to show you is a totally different thing. Let's look at all the stock prices for a given day. So there are 400 stocks. Okay? I say that's a fingerprint or a snapshot of the market for that day. Okay? There are 3,000 days, so I'm going to cluster the days on the snapshot of the market. I'll normalize them all to be on day one, one or something. This is what you see. <laughs> that's the Standard and Poor's price fluctuations. And you see that the days, in fact, cluster in epochs. These bars are days that fell into the same cluster. Okay? So there's something about the prices of the stocks during those days that's characteristically similar. And then suddenly the snapshot of the market changes to be something dramatically different. One way to look at this is to look at the correlation matrix for the stock prices for the averages during those segments. And these show you which the dark areas are which stocks are correlated with one another in their behavior for that period. And the answer is the market undergoes phase transitions to different structures of correlations during those periods. And this includes, by the way, 2003 to 2006 when the market goes crazy. So <laughs> um, it's sort of amusing. It's a bit of a surprise. It's my understanding somewhere buried bar in the literature, I was told by somebody, somebody else observed something like this. <laughs> OK, <laughs> yes? These are not panics. A pan well, actually, so here's uh, 2003. I mean, that's where the market goes to hell. Things are happening within that thing where things are changing, OK? So it's not just panics that we're looking at. And in these regions, they're not panics at all. But they're different. So the next question, of course, is Dan is going to ask me as soon as we leave the room, which is, so how do you make money off of this? <laughs> And the answer is damned if I know, OK? I mean, a much more deep. By the way, this was data came from somebody at a hedge fund. So he's asking that question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the answer is, I don't know. I mean, what I know is the market is doing something funny, OK? And if I can understand, it looks almost like a finite state machine. So if you could figure out who follows whom with enough data, you might be able to predict the change and say, oh. <laughs> Or switch to the other one, or switch to the other one, and, and look at the pattern of what you think will be happening. Uh, but now you're asking me questions about arbitrage based on looking at these patterns, and I don't know the answer, OK? Or whatever. <laughs> you, should, you should put day on rather than number of days. It is. Oh, sorry, no, I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah. but. We have it by the time and days from the beginning of the data. At any rate, that's what happened, OK? So I'm going to sum it up only four minutes late, so you didn't ask a lot of questions. DQC is a new kind of powerful visual paradigm for exploring and analyzing big, complex data sets. What we see is something really new. Big, complex data sets sometimes contain non-trivial structures. By structures, I mean not simple what you would have called a cluster, what you think of as the points, but things that just hang around. What are they revealing? They're revealing that subsets of your data contain unexpected multivariate correlations that are sometimes parameterizable in terms of less variables than you think. Okay, And we can pull them out, identify them, study them, and only look at the subset of interest. Uh, so these are complex, information-rich objects. So lest you think they always occur, they don't. Many data sets without these structures. Okay. Uh, however, they occur frequently enough that knowing they can exist 
and they can be exploited is very important. Okay? The algorithm doesn't care about the data. Anything you can give me that goes into numerical form, and remember the aquaporin data was really letter data that we just converted arbitrarily to numerical form uh, for doing uh, cell cycle analysis to identify which regions trigger certain, which proteins trigger certain behavior. We use a slightly smarter algorithm for converting it to numerical data so that the letters are all equally spaced from one another in configuration space. But anyway, it works on data. It doesn't find structure in random data, at least all the examples we ran. And the Alzheimer's data, which it did find structure in the Alzheimer's data, by the way, but not correlated with Alzheimer's. That's what I should really tell you. And uh, in fact, it turned out probably to be correlated with ethnicity, which people use the SNPs for. But the data was so sanitized, I couldn't pin that down. Okay. Uh, it works on data that other methods don't work on. Okay. It's great strength. So people ask me, how do you do in comparison? Somebody just sent me an email. How do you do in, oh, you. <laughs> how do you do in comparison to these other algorithms? K-means, support vector machine, machine learning algorithms. So the answer is, on small data sets where everybody works, OK? If I have a data set of a few thousand, and it does have structure in it that you can see when you put it up there, uh, there's a score that's done for these things called the Jacquard score. So I'm only talking to him now. And you don't really want to know what the Jacquard score because I think it's a piece of crap. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but nevertheless, you're supposed to calculate the Jacquard score. So we always do a little bit better. OK. We can typically get numbers from 0.6 to 0.9. Uh, I was speaking to somebody at Hanford Labs who, uh, so, sorry, Pacific Northwest Lab, who was uh, a guy who did work in intelligence. And we were talking about these things. And, and I said, he asked me that question. I said, well, you know, we do OK. We get a 0 0.7, 0 0.8. 0 .8. He said, I'd kill for a 0.7 or a 0.8 or a 0.9. But <laughs> he said, I get 0 0.4 and 0.5 and 0.3. And I said, yeah, but I'm not impressed by that. I'm more impressed by the fact that I can look at data you can't get anything on. And so all of the focus of what I'm talking to you is about data sets where other things just don't see anything. Or you put so many assumptions in that you don't know whether you saw something or you did something else. Doesn't mean you can't work on these big data sets with enough assumptions and get stuff. Good question. A lot of data biases built into it, incredibly built into it. Right. Uh, I think what you're coming up with here is an argument that uh, the biases kill the quality of the data when people don't have an adequate means of filtering large data. And so uh, when you were talking about the Alzheimer's data in particular, uh, you were hinting at uh, a significance that was possibly being hidden by such. Would this be a tool to, to allow for honesty in data uh, after a fashion that convinces, say, but government sponsors uh, that, yes, we did find something. We don't understand it yet. Uh, and I won't slant the data in order so to get it. You're thinking SETI, for example? So we work great on time series data. <laughs> OK. Um, the answer to that is maybe. For me, at the moment, so you know, people say, how much do you have to do to develop the algorithm? The answer is, for the algorithm, nothing. It's defined. It's been published. We have a patent on it. There's a company interested in it. I mean, the algorithm is the algorithm. Where is the future work? I gave you five examples precisely to show you every data set is one data set, OK? Uh, that uh, there will be patterns in how you deal with certain kinds of data. And then you can, it's, the tool has only one command, but it's pretty flexible how you use it, OK? So it's also a Swiss Army knife of looking at data. Uh, yeah, I think biases in the data do show up. They show up in certain parameters in the data. You tend to see that the way you saw it in the aquaporin data. Uh, you can dig in and look at that and say, if I get rid of those, do I improve my correlations with what I'm looking for? Do I make them worse? Since you're not doing anything but throwing things out, uh, and then you run the same analysis you did before. Remember, we're not using training sets. 
we take the whole data set. Can we use training sets? Yes. If what you want to build is a classifier later that lets you run on petabytes of data distributed all over the world, yes. I can analyze a big enough subset on a single cluster or supercomputer and develop the quantum evolution operator. So now you have to know what I'm talking about maybe another time. But that's not, this isn't the place for that. But we store a certain number of 2,000 by 2,000 or 4,000 by 4,000 matrices. There's one such matrix for every dimension in the problem, and there's one evolution operator. Everything is done by multiplying and computing expectation values. Evolve, calculate the new coordinates, Evolve, calculate the new coordinates, OK? Matrix multiplication can be parallelized as much as you want. So if I have these operators and now I have data which is new data of the same sort, I can send these operators out to the remote machines, evolve the data, measure the location to the template, which I also have, which I ran on, and then bring back the identification of the data. So I can have a very distributed classifier. The NSA liked that. OK. <laughs> um. Hi. Oh, sorry. No worries. Um, so your first uh, positive example with those 69 points really uh, caught my attention. Yeah. Because it seemed like that's the kind of data that, in a normal analysis, you just throw it out as a statistical outlier and don't even, don't even include it. So my, my question is, and you touched on, you mentioned SETI, since we're at SETI, um, is it possible to take like Arecibo data, or now that the government shut down, maybe Allen Array data, and, and, and find a really tiny needle in a hay haystack, like a signal? So I told you the answer to that, really. It's every data set is one data set. Given the Arecibo data, and somebody who wants to help work on it, one should look at it and see if there's a really tiny needle in the haystack. There might be, there might not be. Sure. I can't, you know, people say, well, this isn't guaranteed to work. Your data isn't guaranteed to have information. Okay, every data set is a data set, okay? It may have information. What I'm telling you is if it has obvious information, we'll find it, even when other methods fail. We've demonstrated the ability to see a part in 10 to the 4 of the data. That doesn't mean we always see a part in 10 to the 4 of the data. But what we can do is we can reduce the 10 dimensions and say, is there anything small? And we can go to 20 dimensions, which you'll never do, and say, do we see anything new? That's the check that we're not harshly cutting on the dimension of the data, even with SVD. SVD is a powerful tool. SVD, everybody who does it knows, is by no means a panacea. And when SVD doesn't show separations in the data, when it doesn't separate it into clumps, it's no better than not doing SVD. OK, it didn't give you any information. Yes? Um, there were two things you, you said which I found really striking and counterintuitive. One was that the compute time is linear in the number of dimensions. That most algorithms you run into the current n squared n cubed yeah or or no exponential usually well but not in most you of have the an intuitive picture of why it's linear and absolutely we should go offline in that but the answer is very simple the way this problem is done is every point is got a center for its gaussian it has a gaussian associated with it okay what we do is we write it as a linear combination of let's say 4,000 basis vectors that cover the data OK? Uh, we then evolve that combination. The point moves. We calculate the location of the center. We do it in finite steps. So it's a little like doing gradient descent, but in parallel for all the points by matrix multiplication. You calculate the new center of the Gaussian. So what is the algorithm? The algorithm, I multiply every data point. I then, for every data point, calc there is a matrix, which is that coordinate as a quantum operator calculate the expectation value of the evolved wave function, you know from Ehrenfest's theorem that the center of the packet is moving according to Newton's laws. It's following the gradient of the potential. So if you move in small steps, modulo some modifications which make it work better than gradient descent that I know about and you don't, but I could teach it to you. Uh, the, that 
thing just moves downhill. So the thing that grows with n is the one-time cost of building the matrices, n matrices. If I have two n matrices, it takes twice as long. And then the n expectation values that I have to be twice as many or twice as many expectation values. So this thing is great as far as parallelization, right? Every thread in this does exactly the same amount of work, so Amdahl's theorem is not a threat to you. There's no thread that's working less than any other thread. And so nobody's finishing early, nobody's finishing late, everybody's finishing at the same time. I'm speaking as if I knew something about computers. I, I know a little. <laughs> but, but in this case, I know it works. Because I look at my machine, and you know, I, I, I'm using a Windows machine, and I just look at the task manager, and I look at my 48 cores, and I know I can't get my mail, and they're maxed out. <laughs> so I now live with that machine running in my laptop. I don't work on that machine at all. Anything any, more? Any other questions? Uh, okay, one last question. Uh, let's see. Could this be implemented on a quantum computer? So I would have to know, in fact, what the real quantum computer be. Most, look, this is really, <laughs> in a very strange sense, the answer is probably yes. <laughs> um, but I don't have a lot of faith in quantum computers, so you're talking to the wrong guy, OK? Quantum computers as now conceived, let's take all the bullshit and throw it away, OK? They're good for certain kinds of problems. They're good for problems where you can check the answer very easily, and it's really hard to find the answer. So that you can run them again and again and again till you get the right answer, because you only statistically are going to get the right answer. If you do it very well, you can make it 99.99% sure that when you measure the data, you have the right answer. Well, that's OK if we're sitting in the room and talking. If you want to keep the rocket in the air or the plane in the air, I'm not sure I'm happy with 99.99% that the answer is correct. Even one in a thousand chance that I'm going to aim the thing in the wrong direction is not appealing. <laughs> So uh, the problems where it's easy to check and hard to do, like factoring primes, like searching a database, where you can then go to the location and say, is this the right location? The lookup is easy once you know where you're supposed to look. You say, no, nope, wrong. Let's do it again. OK. Uh, this is really an out. So it uses quantum mechanics as a trick. It's a bizarre way of using quantum mechanics to deal with a classical problem. Um, don't confuse it with something quantum mechanical about the problem. There's nothing quantum mechanical about these problems. It, the algorithm is strange, I, I admit. I mean, people say to me, is it unusual? And I say, it's not out of the box. It's outside the building you keep the box in, OK? <laughs> <laughs> it's a strange way to do things. But it really works. I hope I convinced you. It does things other things can't do. It's really fun to run these analyses. The movies are so great to interact with. Because <laughs> you see what's happening. And remember, every step means something. So we can look at things that persist for 100 frames and then collapse. That's not possible in k-means or something, where only the final result matters. The intermediate stages are wrong. We don't do what machine learning algorithms do. No training set. No built-in, and, and what's the bias in a training set? It's what you put in the training set. <laughs> you told it what to recognize. We're just looking for things that are doing the same stuff in a big data set. I think he says we're finished. Yes. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you have any more questions, and I'm sure there are, um, please feel free to come up to Marvin uh, sure. uh, right now. Marvin, I normally have a mug to give you. Unfortunately, the cleaners uh, cleaned away the mug <laughs> of the left in the corner. So I'm not going to get my mug. Oh, you will. You will. I just can't, <laughs> can't do it right now. But uh, okay. we'll make sure that that gets to you. Good, but because I would have been, I would have gotten on the blog and really <laughs> slammed you guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking Marvin for his work. That's my email address and I answer it.